My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... The thing is, I want to learn. And as it turns out, I work with people who know a lot about classical music. Every week on this show, one of my coworkers will give me a homework assignment, a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the Classical Classroom. Last time on Classical Classroom. Dr. Michael Rimson taught us about the composer John Adams, not the dude who signed the Declaration of Independence, and his minimalist opera, Nixon in China, which is all about an actual trip President Nixon took to the actual country of China. Meanwhile, in the opera, Nixon was having a pensive moment, suddenly aware, was he, of his visit to China's place in the history books. But then his suspicious side came out... And he sang about rats chewing sheets. And now for part two of our conversation with Dr. Michael Remsen and act two of Nixon in China. So back to the music. What are we going to hear next? Uh, Well, I I thought we would go to the beginning of act two. One of the things that so many of the critics of the piece, and, and the piece has lots of critics, but one of the areas that they feel that the piece is particularly effective in is showing us the... Uh, the two women characters who were central to what was happening. And and they are the focus of Act 2 of the opera. And, you know, Act 1 and Act 3 are very much about the the political side of what was happening, the sort of the surface, this, you know, the the visual images that were seared into our collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. And Act 2 is really about the two women who were at the center of what was happening. And the first of those two women was Pat Nixon. You know, Pat Nixon is a fascinating figure in, in contemporary history. She saw herself as a very as a very simple person and that she'd come from very humble backgrounds. She was a farm girl. And here she was. She married, you know, a nice boy who was a local politician who became president. And, you know, regardless of how we felt about her, she saw herself as very unprepared for what was happening. And, of course, this whole trip to China, this was unbelievable, you know, that, I mean, nobody had ever really done anything like this before, and and, and certainly not in such a public way. Mm -hmm. And like every first lady, she had a super important job to do, and that was to be the human face of what was happening, Mm -hmm. you know, over there. And so the images that are, you know, again, if you're a certain age, the there was this red coat that she wore that was knee length with these little knee boots that she had that she it seemed like she went everywhere in those when she was in china and that's what she wears throughout the entire opera <laughs> and you see her and this opening of act 2 is when she goes on a tour uh, she's taken by madam mao i mean by a uh, chairman mao's secretaries on a tour to see the real people of china if you will it's probably the most touching section of the opera where she goes from sort of place to place and, and meets people and sees people. And there's a very touching exchange that we'll hear in, in this section. It's not an aria, really. It's just a, it's just a scene. Can, can you tell me, I mean, I understand a little bit what an aria sure. is. Yeah. is and That's it's an just easy question. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. An aria, I mean, really in the most traditional sense, an aria is, it's a solo, uh-huh. uh, generally speaking. And it is a time when when the action of the opera kind of slows down mm-hmm. or stops and where the character can reflect emotionally. Usually it's a place where there's more emotional expression I see. On, the part of the, on the part of the character. Now, in contemporary opera, of course, all this gets turned on its ear. But in the traditional sense, that's what we're dealing with. And even here, this is – we have the scene where, where you know, Pat is being taken around and mm-hmm. sees all these things and – a lot of action is happening. And then at the end of this scene, in a section we won't listen to today, but the, it's one of the better known arias in the piece where she pauses and she reflects on everything she sings and she wishes, it, the aria is called This is Prophetic, at, which is halfway through act two. And she reflects on everything she's seen and expresses her wish for peace in the world. And it's a very personal moment. Mm-hmm. It's a very personal expression, and that's the difference between sort of the aria and the scene. You'll see in the section we're going to hear, there's just a lot of 
things happening. I mean, she's she goes to a factory that makes little um, ivory elephants, and she remarks, "Oh, well, this is the symbol of our party." And you can see her being the very, you know, the politician's wife. But then, as we go further, she goes to a school and she sings to a child, you know, that she remembers when she was a teacher. And she said, this is so wonderful because now, you know, I was a teacher, but now I get to learn from you, from Mm -hmm. the children of China and this very sort of personal moment uh, that we see. So it's all these things that happen. And then the aria becomes the summation, if you will, of that, of that, of those experiences Mm -hmm. in emotion. Is an aria always a monologue? No, not always, but but generally in the most traditional sense. Yeah. (laughs) I'm always reluctant to speak in, <laughs> in absolute terms, you yeah. know, because somebody, well, that, I mean, that's true somebody out there will go, that's music. not true, there's it is, you know, I mean, yeah. so it's generally speaking, yeah, okay. it's, it's more often than not, it's a little. Okay, let's hear it. Let's hear the opening of Act Two. Yeah, this is just the very beginning. And so here at the beginning, you, we have that same nervous energy mm-hmm. in the music that we had in News, but very different colors in the orchestra the woodwinds you know mm-hmm. are are there and even this these little sort of little sounds of the flutes and the mm-hmm. oboes sort of piercing the the texture to me this reminds me of birds singing almost like and it sets a very soft beginning for the act for the second actor as opposed yeah. to this sort of very aggressive you know nixon aria it's just a much softer color mm-hmm. that it that we're surrounding and we see pat she's lying on a bed in, she's wearing the red coat and the boots, and she sits up, and you can tell she's the stress of this is really weighing on her. And and she gets up, and she takes an aspirin, and she tries to move around, and then she's like, "Now nah, I'm gonna lie back down." And so she lies back down for a while, and then she finally, then the the secretaries arrive and start taking her around on the tour. Okay. wonderful section where she's when she sings the word triviality or trivial mm-hmm. it's just a second and it, it gives it this sort of harmonic flavor but then when she sings good lord it's this huge leap of an mm-hmm. octave or a tenth that that is her emphatic you know good lord you know, yeah it's, i'm very emphatic about it. it's a beautiful setting it's really one of the most melodically enchanting sections of the opera and you can tell that at least i like to think that adams felt very very warmly about Pat's character and gave her these really lovely melodies to sing. Mm-hmm. Is the the librettist the person who wrote the the words Alice trying Goodman, to yeah. yeah is she is she trying to um, sort of just introduce this character of Pat? Very human, yeah, like, very very okay. human here where you know she sings I treat each day like Christmas and trivial things are not for me. Okay, I like that. Every, treat every day like Christmas. Yeah. And now this uh, Chairman Mao's secretaries have come to take her on her tour and will take her around and they say, you know, look at, look at the earth, look at the, you know, the simple things that are out there. And it's how they connect initially, mm-hmm. is around the simplicity, each in their own way. Mm-hmm. Are they sort of acting like a like a chorus? Very much so. Okay. I mean, the 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 casting. It's really actually quite brilliant of the of Chairman Mao's secretaries. It was three women who sang in unison the whole time. So they did. They were like this little Greek oh. chorus running around stage <laughs> the whole time. Neat. Again, this softness of the mm-hmm. orchestral texture.
So she's holding the statue of the yeah. elephant. And she thinks it's one of a kind. And the, and the secretaries are like, no, this is mass produced in our factories. And, you know, they, it, the elephant for the Chinese is a symbol of the, the abilities of the communists to do all of this and, you know, oh. to churn out thousands of these in factories every day where she's seeing it as this metaphor for the, for the party, for the Republican Party right. and its successes. So very interesting, this small object becoming, you know, two very different ways of looking at the object. Uh, yeah. And it represents the sort of two very distinct viewpoints of the characters mm -hmm. on stage. And now, and all of this, you have to remember, was on the news. I mean, that, that they go to a clinic, and she sees someone get a shot, and she's like, "Ooh, ouch!" You know? <laughs> and, but all of this was on the news. You know, yeah. you saw they're, these, they're following the visuals, her around and with cameras. Literally, we, yeah, and we're okay. literally following history around in the context of the of the opera. And so now <laughs> they go to a farm, and everybody's yelling because they say, "Oh, come see the pig! It's a prize-winning pig." And you'll hear the chorus here, and they sing pig, 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 and it's a, it's a hilarious text setting here. There's a wonderful sense of humor here. <laughs> and these wonderful brass surges underneath. <laughs> And hear the complexity of the rhythms. Mm -hmm. So much more interesting than sort of the you know the the cliche of what minimalism is. This rhythm is very jarring and yeah. interesting and fun. And here are some children having fun. And then here she meets the children. This is it's so explicit. We are some children having fun. Yes, I know. It's very <laughs> it's sort of again that directness and and what gets lost in the translation. It's like uh -huh. yes, here are some children having fun. And now here's the music from the opening again. Adam's very cleverly bringing it back around to the beginning, mm -hmm. uh, to the music we heard at the beginning of the scene. And again, sort of helping us connect our way through, you know, a fairly long, a fairly mm -hmm. long act here, so that we have sort of guideposts, if you will, like an to, sort anchor. Of, to take us through yeah, in a lot okay. of ways. Yeah. Uh, the scene melts away, and Pat is left alone on stage, and she sings her great aria. This mm -hmm. is prophetic mm -hmm. about everything she's just witnessed and what this means to her and again the the, the wish for a peaceful future mm -hmm. and she'll move into it right here yeah. so you said the second act mainly focuses on these two women so so it's pat nixon nixon's, in the beginning nixon's wife yeah and then also mao's and then on madame mao is is for the complete opposite okay. for the for the second half of the act and what happens is is after this scene we we go to the, I think it's at the Imperial Palace, and uh, the Nixons have been invited to see a ballet. Mm -hmm. And they actually recreated a real ballet uh, for the piece. It was a ballet called The Red Detachment of Women. And mm -hmm. it, it was written by Madame Mao. Uh, and I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation of her name, but I think it's Zhang Qing is how her name was said. And, you know, Madame Mao led the Cultural Revolution, and as you said, like all Western things were, you know, cultural things were suppressed mm -hmm. in China at this time. And what was happening was that um, 
you know, she was writing things and other people, you know, were writing things had to be approved in order to be presented, you know, sort of by the government. And so there were these um, operas, it was called the, there were the eight model plays that she created, which was a new form of stage drama mm -hmm. uh, that were sort of sanctioned by the government of mm -hmm. what could be approved for uh, the Communist Party entertainment. And so this was one of the ballets that was part of that. And as I said, it was called The Red Detachment of Women. And it told the story, I mean, it told the story sort of true to the heart of communism, where you had a sadistic, brutal landlord who represents money, mm -hmm. uh, who is uh, ultimately beaten by a group of women farmers and laborers, and how these women rise up and they, they, they are able to uh, prevail mm -hmm. over the brutal landlord. And so, of course, the, here's, you know, it's promoting the values of communism. And so they, so the Nixons are invited to this performance, and this actually happened. This part of it actually happened where they were invited to the performance. But then, they, <laughs> uh, in the performance of the opera, they take some real liberties here. And first off, the the brutal landlord is portrayed by the Henry Kissinger character. Mm. Uh, he he sort of folds into the action, and there's a scene where he is whipping the heroine, uh, our, our the 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 girl who's the heroine of the of the piece, and he's whipping her, and Pat gets so caught up in the moment of what's happening, that she rushes on stage to protect the girl, and she becomes essentially part of the action. Whoa. And Madame Mao is um, furious that this has happened, and uh, she feels that, um, that her artistic uh, intents have been misunderstood and that, that these people here are mocking the values that she holds dearly. Mm -hmm. And so she sings this huge aria. I mean, now this is an aria. <laughs> and it is, it is a bravura piece that is extraordinarily difficult called I Am the Wife of Madame Mao. And it, in the aria, she reasserts her position okay. as the leader of the Cultural Revolution and, and that nobody is you know, sort of more important than she is at this particular moment. And she reasserts her place in what is happening at this moment in history. And this is a crazy aria. It is very, very difficult to sing. Some people have compared it to the famous Queen of the Night aria from Mozart's The Magic Flute, which is also notoriously difficult to sing. When you say bravura, bravura it is just, what does it that is, mean? It is the... Um, it's the character like of, of the aria of... itself, where she where she is bigger than life, and okay. she is pro, she is proclaiming her you know herself. She is standing up and assuming her place in the picture Got of what's it. happening here. And so it is, but yes, this this sense of bombasticness. Mm -hmm. What is the adjective for that? Bombasticity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, but she it is it is a um, you know she's she's furious, and but she is also. Um, she is she's going to make sure that everybody knows who she is and what her place in this moment is. Okay. And so it is it is um, a wonderful, wonderful aria. And we sh let's listen. Yeah. Yeah. So you get this rhythm, this magisterial rhythm. Ba -dum -bum, ba -dum -bum, ba -dum -bum. I love the use of the text there because because she first she sings when I appear the people hang, and then she sings when I appear the people hang on my every word, <laughs> and so it gives you two very different meanings of what's happening there, and you hear the brass are just I mean it, just pounding the rhythms away mm -hmm. in this aria, and so it gives it this huge sort of furious character uh, that underscores this whole thing, and then here she's just soaring up. Is all opera so literal, or is just is this an Alice Goodman thing? I mean, it, it, like, there are all these points where I'm noticing that she's saying, I am the wife of Mao Zedong. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and the children earlier were singing, we are children playing. Yeah, it, it, it's very... It is. A, I, no, it's not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But there certainly are lots of examples in, in opera, especially early opera, where characters kind of come out and say who they are. But this is a very different kind of scene. You know, okay. I mean, the she's reasserting her position here it's it's not just oh. like she's not introducing herself she's there are saying ways. like she's saying, i'm the wife yeah, of Mao Zedong. who's got like, two you thumbs need to yeah, pay who, attention that's right who's got two <laughs> thumbs and is the wife of madame Mao? that would be this guy you know that's that's what's happening here it's not like she's introducing herself to the okay to the characters and she's the like recognize yes yes you okay. will you will uh, respect my authority okay yeah. <laughs> And of course, all of this as she sings, you know, that everything that she follows, the book, which is, of course, the book of Mao Zedong's sayings. The Little Red know, Cookbook. The, this, exactly. Yeah. And so that everything she does is by the book, which reflects her philosophy of, and, and also her importance. And then she sings this middle part here. She's singing, so let me be a grain of sand, you know, which is very sort of philosophically tied into this mm -hmm. kind of the concept of communism that you're that you're just one of many you know even if you're important but you're still one of many but then she'll jump back up and she's and then we'll come back and again the structure of this aria is very much the same as in news we have an opening a middle section here with the chorus joining in and then we'll return to the i am the wife of mm -hmm. madame mao at the end here <laughs> But what are they shouting? Joy. Oh, okay. <laughs> and here we are at the beginning again. high notes and the texture of this almost sounds like an organ at mm -hmm. times it just that sort of bombastic sound mm -hmm. just behind her it's like all the force of the orchestra mm -hmm. is just right there and which only adds to the difficulty for the singer I love those those uh, I don't know if it's trombones or what but the sort of blowout oh, sound I know. Yeah. oh my god so the, cool. the low brass section gets a workout in yeah. this opera <laughs> percussion bass drums the music in this part is so different than everything else mm -hmm. well because it's there's no place else in this opera where the emotions are so on the surface okay. really i mean it's i mean sh this is you know you will pay attention to me mm -hmm. you will you will respect me yeah and it's all just right on the surface and so i think he i think adams very wisely brings the brass and the percussion in here just to you're going to feel this in your bones if you're sitting right. in the audience this is going to go right through you. the seats are shaking mm -hmm. yeah There are just so there's so much to take in with opera. There are <laughs> every single one. Yep. So, so many moving parts. I mean, it's it's, um, it's it, it is unbelievable everything that's going on. You know, you the just prep work, I'm sure. when you really, you know, it, it, it's kind of almost fun to like go to an opera once and absorb the story and the music, and then go back and when you're a little familiar with the piece, and just think about like, oh my God, what are all the mechanics? That are making this happen, you know, all the stagehands, the mm -hmm. chorus, the orchestra, the lighting guys, the costume people who are running around, the sets. I mean, there's, it is a, a, a small army of people who pull off magic virtually yeah. every day. I know. You're ready for the bar after that. Wow. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One fun fun fact too is you know if, if it, it, it is a great opera and it's really for the pieces in the last quarter of the 20th century, I mean, it's probably the one that's going to have the most legs. And mm-hmm. I don't dare to prognosticate on some levels, but, you know, 100 years from now, this this opera will be in the history books, I'm sure of it. Mm-hmm. And it's an important work, and it's had a, a, a variety of performances. You know, it's had many performances since the premiere here in Houston. But a fun thing that actually they just announced recently is that um, Houston is going to restage the work for the 20th, really? for its 20th anniversary. So Neat. if you can hold on till 2017, I think it's the 1617 season where they're going to where they're going to do it again. I'd so, actually like to see that. Oh, I will but, definitely. I mean, this have, sounds really interesting. I will definitely have my tickets. That's no no question about it. I'll go at least at least once and probably a couple times because it's know, just a great opportunity to see this work. Yeah, you've um, me saying that I'm like yes, I would love to go <laughs> see that opera yeah. <laughs> means that you have worked yeah. magic, Michael. Houston Grand Wilson. Opera, you need to call the station right now. And- <laughs> You sell this lady a, a subscription. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> well, Michael Rimson, thank you so much for coming onto the program today. Um, this has been sort of personally revolutionary for me because I, I would not pick up an opera on my own. And uh, now I'm actually interested in listening to this one and, and reading the lyrics and learning about it. Well, if this is a gateway for you to go backwards in opera history and maybe... Interestingly, for most people, it's the older works that become the gateway to the newer works. But mm-hmm. if the but there is, I think that operas become relevant again, yeah. and it's become trendy again. I think in the in the fifties and sixties, opera was in real trouble, mm-hmm. and then there was a, a generation of composers who got turned on by what the possibilities were and did new works that got people really excited, like Einstein on the Beach, like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Philip Glass's Akhenaten is if unbelievably beautiful work. And there was a whole younger generation that got really turned on by opera, including me. And that became, even though I grew up around opera, this was in many ways for me a reintroduction to it because it, it was a gateway to go backwards on some mm. level. So hopefully it is it is for you too because there's, yeah. there's amazing music out there. And once you get past the, the the odd convention of what opera is, it's mm-hmm. it's a beautiful beautiful world, and it's it's such an exciting uh, it's such an exciting form for me. It's just so incredibly viable. There, it is a world of magic. You know, people think movies transport you, but mm-hmm. and they do, but opera does in a, a whole new a whole new way. Opera people be crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Michael, thank you so much for coming on today. I it's really been totally my it. pleasure. I've had a gas. Yeah, it's been awesome. Everybody, thanks for listening. If you have something that you would like to hear on the program, please send me an email at dclay at classical917.org. And if you need to find out about past or present episodes or any other information that's possibly relevant to the show, go to classical917.org backslash classroom. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.